good morning or afternoon or evening, everyone, uh, depending on where you're uh, located. My name is Audrey. I'm part of the, the BD and marketing team uh, at Condo. So before we get into the main presentation, I just wanted to mention a couple of things. Um, some housekeeping. Um, we are recording this session. It will be available on YouTube afterwards. Um, so if you go to our YouTube channel, you can find it there. And we will also be sending an email with the details. If you have any questions uh, throughout the session, uh, just use the Q&A box and we'll be saving a little bit of time at the end uh, to answer these questions. Uh, today's webinar is part of um, World Green Building Week and um, we are hosting um, these webinars all over the world. We have 12 webinars taking place. For those of you who are not familiar with World Green Building Week, it is the World Green Building Council's annual campaign, which empowers us all to deliver greener buildings. This year, the theme is to act on climate uh, by calling on the building sector, policymakers, and governments to take urgent actions to deliver uh, net zero buildings. So in order to act on climate, we are hosting these, um, these virtual events, uh, which are called triage for an ailing planet, uh, talking about how to prioritize our actions and decarbonize the whole built uh, environment. So today uh, here with us, we have um, Kevin, Kevin Hayes. Uh, Kevin is the managing partner for the London office. And Kevin also leads uh, Condol's uh, global corporate real estate sector. And uh, taking us through the main presentation is Simon Wyatt. Uh, Simon is a sustainability partner at Condol, and he also uh, leads Condol's uh, building physics, health, and well-being sustainability team. So without further ado, uh, I'll hand it over to uh, Kevin. Thank you very much, Audrey. Um, good morning, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome on board. Um, triage for an alien planet. I mean, I guess that's the kind of million dollar question here. What does that mean? Um, for us at Condor, it's very much about um, embedded everything we do in terms of sustainability, uh, innovation, things that can drive digital solutions. Um, but really at the center of this is all to do with carbon profiling, um, net zero, all the kind of topical things that are kind of you know, being bounced around at the moment in terms of how we occupy buildings of any type and how buildings um, are designed, delivered um, within, the, within the built environment. So Kundal as a business, how do we, um, what does this mean for us? Um, obviously we've been successful in terms of driving sustainability for many years now, um, across obviously our 25 offices, um, obviously 950 odd at the moment as we're all working from home. Um, but we was the first One Planet company to kind of really uh, live by our principles of what we advise our clients and really kind of um, deliver what we do and what we preach. So that was kind of a key milestone um, some years back now. But I think where we sit now, um, being the first carbon neutral consultancy, um, is quite a powerful thing to actually say, actually. This kind of followed a, um, a certified carbon neutral assessment on a pilot scheme we did in Australia. Um, and come, um, I think we're going to be fully certified. Some I can talk about this later um, at the back end of this month. So that's a real good positive news that we can push out there. And that's across all three scopes. Um, so we're not certainly resting on our morals. And I think you know the key message in here is um, these things can be done. Um, yes, they do require investment, but um, they are all achievable. So Simon, in his talk later, will go through how we can achieve that, the best ways of achieving that. And obviously, cost and investment will come into it. So I'm sure there'll be quite a few questions in that regard. Um, but they are real positives which we can move forward. Simon, if you could change the slide. Thank you. Um, so what does that mean for us? I mean, we operate um, globally. Um, obviously, we have 24 offices. It really does depend on where we are in the, uh, in the world. The markets are mature. I think uh, Australia is mature, and we're seeing bigger signs now where the UK and the countries in Europe are really driving this and kind of really thinking about what does this mean to building stock. Um, we often think about net zero and carbon profiling on on new buildings because that's kind of the easy thing to kind of deal with. Um, but what we really need to be looking at um, is the probably 90% of the stock which is new, uh, sorry, which is existing. 
how do we repurpose existing real estate to really drive net zero and really deal with the, the impact of um, carbon in our built environment. So I think that's the real challenge. Um, you know, developers, occupiers, you know, I head up our uh, global corporate real estate solutions group, which is very much focused on the, the, uh, the, the tenant and the entity. And obviously that's going through some challenging times at the, at the moment with the return to the office. But um, in the last 12 months, it's very much been on everyone's agenda in terms of what buildings people occupy, uh, net zero being a key driver there. So it's certainly um, gathering momentum, but I think it needs more. Um, and hopefully the events that we're going to be hosting this week will kind of reinform our messaging and um, get the results out of this to the market where we can, uh, where we can all push on. Through our offices uh, globally, we kind of operate um, in most sectors really, but we also have um, all our services. So we have our core services disciplines, which are primarily you know, structural civil building services and sustainability. Um, we kind of have you know, data centers and mission critical as well, which is obviously a, a very big provider of um, energy in terms of that context. But even across all of our specialist groups, we embed everything that we need to do in terms of net zero, energy reduction, sustainability solutions. Um, and it's kind of brought everyone together on a kind of single journey to be one candle and one goal in terms of what we try and achieve on our, on our, on our drive to push the agenda, um, especially for the triage for the alien planet. And we have to, we have to keep pushing. Um, within the, our kind of services, we operate you know, within dedicated sectors. As I said, I'm, I run our corporate services group, and I think um, there's certainly some challenges there. I think um, it's definitely on the minds, and it's definitely on the agenda of um, a lot of the corporations that we, um, we represent and uh, look after for our global network of offices. But the, I think the building stock... Um, that they occupy or look to occupy is one of the key challenges at the moment. How can we really um, get the best out of what we have already? Um, I mean, I'm always of the opinion that we repurpose instead of knock down and rebuild. Um, and obviously you've got the embodied carbon piece there as well. So I think the real journey is gonna be about how we do about you know, existing building stock, as I said earlier on, that's gonna be the real emphasis, I think, moving forward. So on that note, I think we'll um, pass over to Simon. Um, Simon can very clearly articulate what this means in terms of climate emergency and um, uh, we'll give you all the facts and information that you can take away. Many thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Um, good, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm just gonna run through today uh, a brief summary of the climate emergency, how we prioritize action, and then finish up with some case studies and some quick wins on actually how we can apply uh, net zero carbon to existing buildings and just general design principles. Uh, we have done over the last six months a number of presentations with the BCO uh, Kundal webinars on net zero carbon. So if you want more detail, they'll be on our YouTube channel and I'll make some references to where you can have a look at that. Today, we're really gonna try and focus on actually applying it to buildings and how we can actually drive those forward. So just to recap, we are in a climate emergency. Uh, what do we mean by this? Well, we've already seen one degree of climate change. The world is one degree warmer already. Uh, we've probably locked in enough carbon to hit 1.5 degrees, which is the lower end of the Paris Agreement aspirational target, with two degrees being the upper end of what they're targeting. But that was over five years ago now, and there's been very little action. Uh, this current pandemic has really shown us what you have to do in emergency, and we haven't seen that emphasis or drive around the climate change agenda recently. Uh, all of the governments have gone away and worked out their carbon budgets over those that time. And if you add up all their carbon budgets, uh, they actually add up to over three degrees. And that's kind of the best case scenario. If everyone hits their targets, we hit three degrees, which is pretty worrying. Uh, we need to take more severe action in order to get down towards that two degrees. Achieving 1.5 is going to be extremely difficult. And over the last couple of years, we've started to see what the actual impact of 1.1 degree climate change actually is. So one degree, we're already seeing significant forest fires around the world. Uh, early in the year, we saw Australia on fire. Now we're seeing uh, America on fire. Uh, in the UK, we see flash flooding more regularly. In February, we had significant floods. Uh, and last year we had the heat waves all across the world, but particularly bad here in Europe. The conditions of danger are starting to be found pretty much all around the world, and it's not just uh, systems 
affecting uh, it's affecting finance it's affecting our built environment uh, and that's for one degree if we get to two degrees it's, and if we get up to three degrees there's some pretty catastrophic uh, consequences so we really need to take action as soon as possible uh, luckily, as um, Audrey was indicating, we're doing these presentations globally and what we've seen uh, by organising them globally is that the UK is actually generally considerably ahead of a lot of the rest of the world. I'm not sure if that's a good or bad thing, uh, but uh, in early 2019, the UK uh, Parliament declared a climate emergency and quickly followed that up by changing the Climate Change Act uh, to acquire us to be net zero carbon as a country by 2050. This was instead of the previous target of 80% reduction, uh, which meant there was 20% uh, of spare capacity where everything was kind of hiding in. And uh, now they've removed the hiding places so that all industries, all sectors, all part of society have to decarbonize towards net zero carbon. But what was interesting was that a month after they made that uh, ambitious target, the Committee for Climate Change came out and said that the UK government wasn't even on target for the 80%. So the challenge of getting to net zero carbon is, is significant and is going to be all consuming for the next uh, decade in order to decarbonise all sectors of the economy. What we found to be very interesting, though, is since that declaration by the UK government, now 408 local authorities in the UK, 70% of them have declared their own climate emergency. And what's interesting is they've all set uh, slightly more ambitious targets and dates. Uh, and when we started mapping these uh, a couple of weeks ago, we realized that the more advanced and developed a local authority is on towards its net zero carbon journey, it, the later the date generally is because they seem to have more understanding of how difficult this is to be. So London is probably the leader in terms of uh, strategy around planning and how to decarbonize its uh, buildings and infrastructure. And they've set an ambitious target of 2040, but pretty much all other councils in the UK have set targets significantly before them, but are looking to London for guidance. So there's some really cha challenging targets here, which uh, the councils are starting to understand the implications and we're seeing planning regulations really ramp up over the last uh, six months. It's not just coming from government. Uh, we're seeing significant drivers for change across the industry. Uh, probably the most significant is investors. So we're seeing more and more investors requiring uh, reporting against climate change adaptation and mitigation as part of their corporate social responsibility. Uh, one of the main drivers here will be the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosure, which was set up by the Bank of England and is now endorsed by all world banks. And that requires organizations to submit uh, climate change reporting on an annual basis. Uh, and we're seeing banks require that of projects going forward. So in order to secure funding, you will have to submit this information. If you want to sell an asset, uh, then again, you would have to provide this information to the purchaser in order to sell that asset. So in order not to have stranded assets, uh, the financial reporting will be a significant driver. The developers have taken this on board with most of the major developers in the UK now signed up to either the World Green Building Council's Net Zero Carbon Commitment or the Better Building Partnerships Commitment. Uh, the Better Building Partnerships Commitment has been signed up by pretty much all the big players in London and it requires them now to report by the end of this year their strategy for de decarbonizing their entire portfolio. So there's significant work around how they actually do that and I'll go through some examples of that later. And where we've seen most interest uh, recently is from the Occupy Group. So working with a number of landlords uh, and then hedge funds, and they're basically having tenants come to them saying they've set themselves ambitious net zero carbon targets around science-based targets, and they want to be net zero carbon. And if the building cannot assist them in doing that, they'll be looking to move. So landlords are ha having to take this uh, uh, as an urgent priority so that they can actually let their buildings and make sure that they have tenants in the future. So it's, it's, there's drivers and action coming from all areas of the industry. Uh, it's, it's not fully coordinated, but it's getting more and more coordinated as we go forward. So what do we do about this? Uh, why is this important to the built environment? Well, the built environment is responsible for 40% of emissions in Europe, uh, of which just over 10% come from the embodied carbon associated with the construction of buildings and 30% from their op actual operations. 
Uh, to address this, the World Green Building Council has been running a program called Advancing Net Zero, uh, which sets some aspirational targets that all new buildings are net zero carbon in operation by 2030 and all existing buildings by 2050. Uh, they brought out a raft of documentations which we've actually helped them put together on embodied carbon and uh, methodologies for reducing net zero carbon and the UK Green Building Council has been pivotal and central to this uh, putting together a really uh, definitive framework uh, of what net zero carbon actually means and this is that framework. So the net UK GBC have defined net zero carbon buildings to be buildings that reduce their construction impact, reduce their operational use, then provide renewables on site where possible, uh, where not possible uh, using green purchase agreements. And then obviously there'll be some carbon remaining that needs to be offset uh, using accredited offsetting schemes. And what's really important is public disclosure so that everything is transparent and visible. This uh, framework applies to both new buildings and existing buildings. Uh, but what's really important is the top two, and I'll go through those in a little bit more detail now. So. Uh, the construction impact and operational energy use. Uh, in order to stop people just offsetting uh, energy intensive buildings uh, and going for the easiest, cheapest solution, the, uh, the industry is looking at energy intensity targets and carbon intensity targets that you must achieve before you actually do that. So in order to do the renewables and the remaining offsets, you have to hit stringent targets around the construction impact and operational use. The question is, how do you set an operational energy target for net zero carbon? Well, if we look at the UK, what we need to basically do to move to a zero carbon economy is provide all of the energy requirements we have from renewable sources. And at the moment, we produce a significant amount of renewable energy, but it's significantly less than the energy or electricity we consume as a country. So what we need to do is move this into balance, which means bringing more renewable online, but also reducing the amount of electricity we use across all sectors, uh, not just the built environment. So what does that actually mean? Well, at the moment, the blue line here is the amount of electricity we generate from renewables, uh, whereas the purple is the peak demand of electricity we use as a country. And in order to move to a net, net zero carbon economy, we need to basically bring this purple line down whilst bringing the blue line up. And when the two meet, we basically have a carbon neutral economy because all of the, our energy is met from renewables. But that means basically we need to reduce our consumption by about 60% across all sectors. And if you think about all sectors, they're not going to evenly uh, decarbonize. Things like aviation uh, will struggle. Uh, uh, vehicles and cars are going to move towards more electric so they're going to have greater demand so buildings will probably actually have to bear a greater brunt and actually reduce more so uh, a simple way of, of setting a target which a lot of uh, green building councils around the world have done and they call it Paris proof targets uh, is basically taking this methodology and saying we need to achieve a 60 or 50 to 60 percent reduction on emissions from a from typical building stock in order to be net zero carbon. Uh, there is another and over time uh, this will become meaning that the operation energy will reduce and the importance of embodied carbon will increase. Sorry these two slides are the wrong way around. Uh, so as well as looking at um, the uh, energy in terms of a top-down approach which is setting those Paris proof targets uh, another organization called Letty the London Energy Transformation actually looked at what was physically possible from a building so they took a typical good practice uh, commercial building here 160 kilowatt hours per meter squared and then applied as many theoretical reductions as possible and then uh, came up with a, a the best case scenario of around about 55 kilowatt hours per meter squared which represents kind of a uh, 65 to 70 percent reduction so it's very much in line with what we saw earlier from the top-down approach uh, and as I said as we as we reduce operational energy embodied carbon becomes much more important and becomes the key driver and what do we actually mean by embodied carbon so embodied carbon or whole life carbon is really the carbon that's associated with the extraction of materials the process of those materials their transportation to site the site activities themselves so building the building once that's completed there and then the practical completion uh, once that's uh, complete that's known as upfront embodied carbon uh, which can be reported on construction of a building 
And then during its life, there will still be carbon used with its maintenance, refurbishment and general use, which needs to be accounted for. And then at the end of the life, it's demolition and hopefully reuse of materials to aid the circular economy. All of this needs to be accounted for. And as operational energy becomes uh, less of an issue, then the embodied carbon becomes much more going forward. And again, what's being set around this is intensity targets. So we recently worked with the GLA, the Greater London Authority, to set their carbon uh, methodology for uh, built all new referable schemes. Uh, we did a review of around about 50 to 60 buildings which had recently been built in London, uh, which had done whole life carbon assessments. Uh, this graph is just looking at the upfront embodied carbon associated with A1 to A5. And most of the buildings that were being built in London that were doing the assessment were achieving just over a thousand. Uh, if you think about that, the buildings that aren't doing the assessments probably are higher because they're not considering it. So the average of a new building generally in the UK is around about 1,200. So the ones that are doing the assessments, slightly lower. But organisations like Letty or um, RICS have actually set much uh, stronger targets uh, looking towards 600 or 350 uh, kilograms of CO2. So again, a 60 to 70% reduction in uh, carbon emissions associated with the construction of buildings. These are really challenging targets. And again, the targets for the future. So again, with grid decarbonisation, this will become slightly easier, but those are really challenging targets on how we move forward. And over the last six months, we've seen a lot of different organisations set intensity targets both around um, embodied carbon, operational energy, whole life carbon. Uh, and it can be a bit of a minefield, but they generally are starting to align. So operational energy, we have targets for commercial offices. Letty has helped set uh, targets for schools and for uh, residential. Uh, and there's more targets coming online, uh, which cover most of the building stock as we go forward. What Kundal have done over the last six months is kind of look at all these standards uh, and pull them together into what we call our steps to net zero carbon. And again, as I mentioned earlier, we've done a number of presentations on this that are available on our YouTube channel. So I'm not going to go in detail on each of these steps, but all these steps should be applied in order. Uh, and you really have to achieve all of them in order to uh, achieve the intensity targets, which uh, we just discussed. So focusing to start with on passive design, then reducing your energy demand and consumption, uh, reducing and eliminating fossil fuels, uh, providing renewables on site where possible and off site where not. Uh, limiting the upfront embodied carbon, uh, considering whole life carbon in conjunction with whole life costing. And then the final one, which is public disclosure, which is really important so that there's transparency in the process and everyone can see what is being done. Uh, so there's less greenwashing and people can be held account of what they're doing. So the main aim of today's presentation is how to focus this action uh, and where to, where, where to start. Uh, and if you think about it in terms of an emergency, when there's a, uh, a natural disaster or a catastrophe, uh, there's normally a triage uh, process applied. So when paramedics is, arrive at the scene of an accident, they basically set up a triage to work out where to focus their energy and uh, attention. Obviously, the, the easiest thing to treat are the uh, walking wounded, which are making the most noise. Uh, they're running around and they're the ones that are calling for attention. Uh, if you think about that in terms of buildings, those are kind of the new buildings. Uh, and what we've done and what we've seen from the industry over the last six months is a real focus on those new buildings. But in 2050, 70 to 80 percent of the buildings uh, that are going to be in operation are already built. And we need to really fo focus on those buildings, the ones that are going to be more difficult, the ones that are struggling now really need to be factored in. Uh, obviously, there'll be a number of buildings which won't make it to 2050, and we don't want to focus our time or attention or resources on those. So it's, it's understanding where to prioritize and where to, and where to focus. And the way we do this is really taking a uh, top-down approach. So we don't want to start, uh, especially if you're a large portfolio owner or state owner, we don't want to just run off and start treating individual buildings. We want to start to understand the entire carbon footprint. So Kundal have broken our carbon services into three levels. So we look at a corporate level. So looking across an entire organization's carbon footprint, including all of their operation, transport, uh, the buildings they operate, uh, the consumables, every single thing that uh, consumes carbon, we, we can review and look at. 
Uh, our main focus over the last few months has been portfolios and estates. So setting uh, strategies for large portfolios where quick and easy wins are, uh, understanding the carbon footprint of those estates and looking at where to focus our resources and activity. And then at the individual asset level, using our steps to uh, zero carbon and applying those to different building types and asset types in order to decarbonize them. As part of this process, there is certification. As Kevin mentioned, uh, we've just, or just going through the final process of becoming a carbon neutral certified organization, so this red line. Uh, but basically you can certify anything to carbon neutral. So you can do individual buildings, you can do events. We just did a uh, carbon neutral certification for some TEDx talks. Uh, you can certify products uh, and you can even certify districts, precincts, or even cities. So there's lots of opportunities and options to uh, decarbonize and cert certify as net zero carbon. And the key to that is reporting and understanding your footprint. So the first part of uh, carbon footprinting and reporting is really trying to understand your emissions across all three scopes, uh, setting reduction strategies and roadmaps. Uh, and then once you've finally reduced your carbon as much as possible, it's looking at uh, offsetting. And where we look at offsetting, we should be looking for co-benefits as much as possible. And, and the key to everything, as I've said a couple of times now, is that reporting mechanism, that transparency, that, so that everyone can see what you're doing, so there's no greenwash uh, and everyone can understand uh, what mechanisms you're using. Uh, I'll just give a review of the different scopes of carbon emissions because we quite often talk about scope one, two, three, and not everyone understands it. And it is different depending whether you're working at the corporate level, the portfolio level, or the asset level. So scope one emissions are probably the most easiest to understand. They're your direct burn of fossil fuels. So if you have a building, that's your natural gas, boilers, or your generators. Uh, if you have vehicles, that's the diesel or petrol consumption uh, across your fleet. Uh, scope two is your indirect electricity, uh, which or indirect use of heating and cooling from district systems. So that's your um, uh, energy use within buildings, and they're the most two understood. And when a lot of organisations say that they're carbon neutral or their buildings carbon neutral, they're only generally focusing on the first two scopes. What's much more difficult is scope three emissions. So you can see there's there's quite a lot of them. Uh, and they basically cover every single aspect of a, of, a build, of a business or building. So upstream associated with their construction and uh, development and downstream associated with their use and sales. Uh, and this covers every type of organization and buildings. And what we've done recently with a lot of portfolio owners and property owners is look to try and understand which uh, parts of scope three should be focused on and which ones generally apply to the built environment. Uh, and we basically uh, circled out the ones which we generally don't focus on with portfolio level uh, and only focus on at corporate level. So these ones that we are left are the ones where we kind of really focus uh, for a portfolio. And they're mostly represented by uh, the RICS whole life carbon methodology, which uh, Chan Lee from our team helped produce. Uh, which covers the life cycle of a building. It doesn't cover all of scope three emissions, but it covers, I'd say, 80 to 90% of them. Uh, so that you still have to be mindful of the others. But this is a really good methodology for looking at uh, carbon across the built environment. So looking at A1 to A5, which is the construction of the building on handover, the B modules, which is the operation, including operational energy, which is a major focus. And then you also should be considering the deconstruction and reuse of that building at the end of its life. Uh, and again, if you are a large portfolio owner, it's understanding how to, much to focus and target. So we've worked with a number of large um, uh, portfolio owners uh, who have used science-based targets, which is uh, using the same methodology that the Paris Agreement used to work out what your fair share of, of carbon is, setting carbon budgets around 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees, and then applying that to an entire business. And if you're a large portfolio investment business, your portfolio is going to be a significant proportion of that. And it's working out what absolute reductions you should be targeting around your estates and then applying it to your different building types so you can set targets. And then seeing how these actually align to things like the Letty UK GBC targets. 
Uh, generally, you should try and make them align as much as possible. And where we work with most landlords, they do. Uh, there are a few organisations we've been working with where their science-based targets are actually more onerous than the LETI requirements, and they're having to drive energy efficiency more uh, robustly. But it's really understanding the entire footprint of that organisation and pushing it through down to their portfolio and their, and their individual asset level. Then it's really looking at uh, the performance of individual buildings and how how they're actually stacking up. So we worked with one of the biggest uh, developer landlords in London uh, and reviewed a number of their buildings using the Australian Neighbours standard. So Neighbours was introduced uh, around about uh, 10 years ago in Australia and it's seen about a 70% reduction in carbon emissions in Australia. Uh, and they do that using a star system. So one to six stars with six stars in effect being net zero carbon. Uh, we are now looking at using the same energy efficiency rating in the UK using design for performance, uh, but we're piloting with a few developers and landlords uh, the review of their estates and we're generally finding that UK stock generally d struggles to achieve one or two stars and we're actually getting uh, negative star ratings on some buildings so there's a significant amount of work to do in the existing stock of buildings in the UK uh, and how we actually drive that. Uh, as we start to collect data, we can actually start using that data to inform quick wins. So this was a study we recently did with Newcastle Council where we took all of their buildings just using the EPC data. So it's not real energy data, but it gives us an indication. So we can, we can mine the data and look for quick trends. And here we quickly saw that for pretty much all of the council buildings, none of them had done air pressure tests or had air pressure tests. Uh, and all of them were using the default uh, values. So by just going in, commissioning air pressure tests and doing remedial work, there were significant savings to be had. Again, using the, the, the um, database of information, we were able to target quick wins. Uh, a lot of the, the portfolio, we looked at uh, what the lighting efficacy average was from the data and realized that we could go in and replace uh, all the lighting in all the poor performing buildings to LED. And again, it was a fairly quick and cheap intervention, which saved significant amount of carbon. Uh, working out which buildings were able to be converted to air source heat pumps from boilers quickly and again targeting those quick wins and easy wins which didn't mean going in and replacing all of the terminal units and uh, individual plant for those buildings. So it's really trying to focus where to spend our time and resource and having large amounts of data enables us to see where the typical trends are and how the, and how the building stock is actually performing. It also enables us to look at outliers. So if you've got a large portfolio, what's a good thing to do is focus on key building types, but also see where buildings are either performing extremely well or, or, or extremely poorly. If they're performing well, the question is why are they performing well and can the rest of the estate learn from it? And if they're performing poorly, what, what's going on there? Are they easy to bring back in line or are they critical buildings which are uh, worth leaving for the time being and, and focusing resource elsewhere? So once we've got kind of the roadmap and portfolio for the corporate level and portfolio level, then it's the uh, big task of looking at the individual buildings and assets. And the way we do this is we use um, basically two levels of, of review. So the main review which we've been undertaking for the last six months have been a high level level one or two review, uh, which is very similar to the ASHRAE, the American standard of energy audits. So a level one or two review is basically just looking at the energy data uh, and are doing a audit of the building to understand how it's performing. And what we do is we use our seven steps. Uh, each step has about 10 components and we go through and rank uh, the building, how it currently performs uh, versus what it needs to do in order to get near zero carbon and then sets a action or intervention list of what needs to be done that can be costed and prioritized so that we can understand what works need to be done. Uh, and again, we, that's useful for looking at things like passive design, uh, the operational energy, uh, whether there's uh, embodied carbon associated refurbishment works. Uh, and it's really important to look at it over a whole life carbon approach because every building type or asset type is very different. Uh, we're using this approach for schools, light industrial units, residential, commercial, and they all have very unique and different challenges. Uh, we're working with the Department for Education and the Welsh Assembly looking at schools programmes and there it's really about passive design and getting low energy buildings going in and retrofitting uh, insulation and really driving the energy down. 
whereas we're working with a number of large portfolio owners with light industrial 90 80 to 90 percent of the load is associated with process so if we use our steps to net zero carbon we might indicate that the buildings perform thermally poorly but there isn't actually much benefit going in and insulating those buildings uh the the focus should be engaging with the tenants and looking at the large roof areas to in, uh, install electrical generation uh residential is a huge challenge uh we have 27 million private homes in the uk which need to be decarbonized uh in uh, over the next 30 years uh and again mass high-rise housing is 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 problematic uh again it's moving to retro passive house retrofit standards and effort standards and looking at potentially using district heating or fifth generation heat networks in order to provide the energy for those buildings uh, and probably one of the biggest challenges especially in london is commercial so smaller offices are generally easier, but where we've got large high-rise buildings which are fully glazed, uh, very energy intensive, uh, unopenable windows, not connected to the environment, there's, there's going to be significant work required to reclad those buildings uh, and re resurface them. There's, there's far too much glare, glazing. We need to prioritise good daylighting in these buildings uh, and then start looking at how we can activate the facades a lot more. So every building type has its unique set of challenges which, which uh, make it very interesting uh, doing these reviews and audits. As well as the high level reviews, we do actually do a much more detailed review which, which is very similar to an ASHRAE level three review where we go in, understand the energy consumption of a building so this is an office building we've just recently done in london where we reviewed the energy consumption we set a pathway down to the net zero carbon target of 55 uh, and the way we did that was doing a detailed calibrated energy model so we, we built a energy model with all the hevac systems set up for the office uh, and then we modeled the interventions in order to get down to that 55 target and ran parametric modeling in order to get down to the challenging target starting by looking at removing the fossil fuel uh, so we could remove our scope one emissions and then setting a pathway down to net zero carbon so interventions such as installing heat pumps improving the fabric integrating natural ventilation and then a significant piece around behavior change and again, what's problematic with existing buildings is you don't get the building uh, in one go normally. Uh, you've normally got tenants uh, and you've also got existing plant, existing fabric, and it's when to replace those and when to do the works. Uh, so what we've done with a number of clients where they have sitting tenants and existing buildings is set route maps over a period of time. Uh, so for that building, the earliest we could actually get the building to be net zero carbon will, will be 2034 because they have a number of sitting tenants and then only when the, the final tenants actually move out and we can refurbish their floors uh, and install new green leases are we able to actually achieve the net zero carbon uh, criteria we've set ourselves. So I've been through quite a lot there. Uh, I'm just going to give you some quick wins and key, key considerations to finish up with. So uh, in terms of quick wins, uh, we find a lot of buildings are in the UK are leaky. Uh, going in and actually just testing the air leakage in a building and seeing the remedial action that needs to be done can be fairly cheap and easy to do. Uh, a lot of buildings in the UK don't have continuous insulation layers, so we're not saying completely reclad a building, but if you do have weak spots, it's fairly easy to patch those over and make sure that there's continuous insulation levels. Uh, again, I'm not going to go through all these, but another major uh, energy saving is associated with LED lighting. Sounds very simple. It is. Uh, it's very cost effective. And again, installing photo cells and absence detection can make a big difference. Uh, and one of the biggest ones we see, especially in commercial offices, is uh, simultaneous heating and cooling. So where the heating and cooling are both set to 22 degrees. Uh, so, the, so one fan core unit's heating, one fan core unit's cooling, and they're constantly fighting each other. If we move those bands slightly apart, so we heat to 20, cool to 24, it means we're not going to be simultaneously uh, doing both at the same time and we can save significant amounts of energy. In terms of key considerations though, uh, over time, you're going to have to do this to most buildings in the UK, which is things like optimizing the glazing area, improving the thermal performance, which is very expensive, looking at air tightness across the entire building, uh, opening up facades as much as possible to enable natural ventilation and mixed mode ventilation. Uh, real focus should be on removing fossil fuels where possible, but obviously that's dependent on tenant and leases and how you actually move forward on that. So you can see 
there are a number of quick wins, but in order to drive that real carbon reduction, there's some serious work that's needed to be done to those building and serious investment. So it needs to be factored in over time and in accordance with a, a financial plan. Uh, and over the last uh, six months to a year, we've really been developing our service line. So again, we're supporting clients at building level, looking at their assets, looking at things like the operational energy, embodied carbon, whole life carbon, passive house design, but also setting portfolio strategies and roadmaps and actually carbon footprinting more and more organizations that aren't affected with the built environment, associated with the building environment. So doing carbon footprinting, certification of events and products, uh, and looking at supply chains, because again, there's only so much we can do at the moment. The key to driving net zero carbon, especially in the construction industry, is looking at our supply chain and how we can affect all of our stakeholders. So it, we can support with all of these, and they're all services that we've developed over the last year, uh, and they're using effectively with clients to decarbonize their estates. And I'll just leave you with the, with the recognition that as you saw earlier the cost of inaction is getting higher the implications of climate change are getting greater we really need to act now uh, and the governments have set a clear trajectory and if we don't act now then there will be financial and stimulus and and, and uh, regulatory uh, drivers starting to affect us so if you want to get ahead of the game you really need to start looking at your assets uh, in the next uh, few years in order to drive that carbon reduction so that's the end of the presentation. Audrey, have we got any questions? Sorry, thank you very much, Simon, for a thought-provoking presentation. We've had a few questions that have come through. Um, so the first question is, uh, what about healthcare uh, buildings? Yeah, good question. Uh, we've actually done a separate event on healthcare buildings. And to be honest, it's probably one of the greatest challenges we've got. Uh, we are working with a few NHS trusts uh, on, on decarbonizing their estates. Uh, it's, it's a massive problematic because they, they, they generally have some of the lowest finance available. Uh, and also they've, they've got to keep the buildings in operation. So building a new hospital, again, isn't that difficult to achieve. The, well, it's challenging to achieve the targets, but not impossible. But decarbonizing existing uh, NHS facilities is extremely difficult. And a, and a big thing around all net zero carbon is uh, maintaining uh, occupancy, quality and comfort. Uh, and if you go into a lot of existing NHS uh, estates, they're not of the greatest quality. They haven't been invested in recently. The, the thermal comfort and performance is poor. So we have to do with all those challenges whilst uh, decarbonizing them. Uh, the same methodology applies, but it's, it's just the finance, uh, where that can come from and how we can do it. Uh, again, if you go online, uh, there we've done a report and a paper on looking at how you can decarbonize NHS facilities. But again, a large focus of that is process because a lot of the spaces have to be closely controlled and they have to achieve certain temperature and humidity control. So it's a lot more challenging, but it is doable. And we have, and we are working with a few trusts to do so. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, next question, uh, could you please discuss the potential conflicts with future proofing against pandemics versus the desire to have efficient buildings, specifically thinking of things like requirements for 100% fresh air, uh, separated on the floor by floor basis, um, additional electrics around touchless solutions, uh, such as doors, taps, etc., and so on. Yeah, it's a really good question. So obviously with the current pandemic, we were expecting to see significant reductions in energy consumption of the buildings, and we, we haven't seen those at all really from the actual data. Uh, some buildings have seen kind of 20-30% reduction, but not significant. Uh, and actually as we're reoccupying buildings at the moment, energy consumption is going through the roof because people are leaving the ventilation on continuously uh, for 24 hours a day to purge and uh, flush buildings. We're also uh, bypassing thermal wheels, so we're not using heat recovery, so that we don't have cross-contamination. So it is a huge challenge, uh, but again, it's not insurmountable. So it's, it's about good design. Uh, openable windows are really important, both for net zero carbon and, and natural ventilation. So the, the main advice from SIBZ and ASHRAE is, is a dilution and airflow. So if you can open windows, that gives you significantly increased airflows. Uh, that obviously has to be done in a controlled manner. And again, with climate change, we're going to have warmer summers. So 
it's about providing both mechanical systems and natural systems. So mechanically ventilate in winter when it's cold and in summer when it's warm. Uh, but for significant periods of the year, if we can, if we can naturally ventilate buildings, it will give us a greater airflow, greater control of those, uh, greater air movement in those spaces, uh, which enables us to fight the pandemic. Uh, and what we're seeing in terms of, you mentioned the individual loads and electrification is we're seeing a move towards smaller uh, sizes of equipment and smaller load profiles. So what we're aiming to do is have very small pieces of equipment which are working at their optimum efficiency and providing small amounts of energy. Uh, and we're even seeing a move away from large uh, energy plants or district heating networks towards more local small electric systems which don't have losses so again if you've got a large uh, building with hot water being pumped around it there's significant losses associated with the pipe work whereas if you can reduce the load to almost nothing and then supply that from a small electric circuit then there's no losses associated with that system or very small losses so it's it's about localization and in, in order to do so good uh, thank you uh, next question, how are you using the data you're collecting to drive uh, governmental mandates and regulation for translation to renewable energy sources and ultimately balance your scale? That's a, a good question. Data is probably the, one of the greatest challenges we face. Uh, we're not very good as an industry at collecting data or sharing that data. Uh, it's generally closed. Uh, SIBSI are running a new database to try and capture as much energy data and what we're trying to do with the government at the moment is to mandate a requirement so as part of the london plan now there's a new section called be seen which means when you finish your building you have to submit your your um, final energy calculations uh, and then going forward you have to disclose every year your energy performance of that building onto a database we'd like that to be a national database and again it comes back to this public disclosure so the idea will be that every building on completion discloses its co2 emissions uh, for the upfront and body carbon and then on a yearly basis reports against the RICS modules uh, b1 to b6 uh, and b7 the, sorry um, so every year they will be reported and that data can be collected and what bays are looking at the moment is a is copying the american scheme which is to bring a mandatory energy performance target for existing buildings so that will basically be at the moment most uk building you commercial buildings operate uh, over 200 kilowatt hours the net zero carbon target is 55 bays are potentially looking to bring in a target to start around about 100 to 150 and any building that performs worse than that will get a financial penalty or fine. Uh, and that will slowly move towards the net zero carbon target. That's been applied in New York now for a while. Uh, and the UK government are seriously considering rolling that through. But they need the data in the first place for all those buildings. So there needs to be the disclosure and public reporting in order to get there. In terms of balancing the scales, it's one thing the UK is doing particularly well. So we've, uh, if you looked during the course of the summer, we had uh, a coal-free summer. Uh, we've gone from six or 7% renewable when I started in the industry from on the grid up to up points 30 to close to 40% uh, renewable energy. So we are doing very well in that regard, but it's gonna become more and more difficult going forward. Uh, in order to close that gap for the peak. So we do need that reduction in order to, to balance those scales from the buildings. Uh, thank you, Simon. The next one um, is for you, Kevin. Uh, what engineering services uh, in the office market are you seeing demand for in response uh, to COVID-19? Thanks, Audrey. Um, I think at this stage, I think it's a, it's a little bit too early to, to, to kind of redefine what engineering looks like in the in the workplace. I think um, what we are looking and now seeing is clients looking at how systems operate. Um, I think some of the simplest things that we should have been doing um, uh, years back is literally looking at how we control systems, how we control the environment within the building. I think Simon just alluded to systems that um, can kind of operationally can fight against each other. So that's one thing from an energy point of view, but from a health and well-being point of view in terms of a post COVID world, I think you know, demand based solutions is still there. How we move air, water, et cetera, around the building. Um, filtration systems are kind of people are looking at that now in terms of how you can achieve better levels of filtration. Obviously um, 
the, the kind of rise of the um, health and well-being through the world guide was a kind of drive to that to deal with them um, particular in the environment so i think that will probably be something that gets um, talked about more but if you, the more you the more you filtrate and the high performance filters uh, will drive energy up so it's kind of driving that balance between um what is sensible within the realms of um existing building stocks because it's not an easy transition into to creating an environment where we can just add things into it it needs to be looked at holistically um, but new build for sure um but i think the greatest component that we can probably do is drive net zero kind of buildings where the option to open windows or mix mode our facades is probably one that's um going to you know, add real purpose and value to what we're trying to achieve just coming on that one one thing that's been interesting with the pandemic is it's it's really just sped up a lot of things which we were seeing before the pandemic like the move towards more agile based working activity based working uh offices that we were designing with kevin's team before the pandemic all the leading office designs were moving less towards traditional office based working and more towards uh activity bases maybe only 30 40 percent of the office as traditional offices focusing on collaboration and activity spaces uh and again the same movement we've seen uh the major organizations focusing on well-being focusing on the indoor environmental quality we're working with a number of big landlords now installing uh, air quality and environmental monitoring sensors. So again, giving that reassurance to occupants about the quality of that space that was coming beforehand. It's just only going to be accelerated going forward. Yeah. And it's, I think it, it would enable, it would be, it would accelerate the smart enabled buildings as well. I think from mm -hmm. an occupier perspective and what landlords need to consider um, in terms of what they're, the real estate looks like and what they what they can deliver i think you know, some developers at the moment are driving that through london um, and wider afield but i think that will become more mainstream as um the drive to collect data and deliver solutions that are truly agile in terms of how they operate is um i think that's, that's where we're going to go and the, and the smart piece is really important because again before we went into the pandemic we a lot of people talking about smart buildings but not really understanding them but uh with the net zero carbon and um, indoor environmental quality smart really starts to become important and having that that piece set up so that buildings are enabled to support the occupier in, in their net zero carbon journey and health and well-being journey is is going to be vital going forward Good. Uh, thank you. So we've got a, a few more questions, so we'll try to, to squeeze them all in. Um, quite interesting one. Um, I represent a startup leisure operation that will be opening sites from 2023, uh, principally in US, but also globally. Uh, we don't have any uh, built assets as yet. What would you recommend as an appropriate route map to guide our development of the built environment? So leisure buildings are fairly energy intensive and quite difficult, uh, but they actually lend themselves quite well, especially if they've got swimming pools uh, to passive house. So passive house is, is probably the, um, the greatest example of operational energy reduction we've seen over the last five or six years came out of Germany and uh, it basically does what it says on the tin. It reduces energy almost to zero and provides it as passively as possible. It works really well for simple buildings with um, simple HVAC systems. So again, it was championed in housing. Uh, it's being used heavily in schools at the moment, but where it works really well is for things like swimming pools and leisure centers, again, where they're heat driven and are fairly uh, simple buildings. So it's reducing that heat loss from the large surface areas. So I'd, I'd focus on the fabric of the building and trying to reduce that heat loss, uh, especially if you've got swimming pools uh, and then looking at using uh, all electric systems. So removing fossil fuel con and combustion uh, using heat pumps. Uh, again, the challenge with heat pump is to maintain an efficiency. So moving away from traditional refrigerants, moving to CO2 refrigerants is, is a good idea for things like swimming pools and showers as well. So there's lots of solutions for leisure. They are challenging. And again, there aren't many targets around that. So using a science-based target or a Paris proof target uh, compared to normal building stock is generally the best approach. You can do that by state or region in the States, uh, but really looking at every single system and trying to optimize it. And again, embodied carbon will be important because there is significant materials go into those buildings. Uh, thank you. Uh, so yes, just a few more. How do you ascertain the optimum point in terms of carbon cost to replace poor carbon performing materials and plants with better performing kit? 
That's a brilliant question. Uh, it's, it's actually a, a major discussion at the moment. So there's a group called the Whole Life Carbon Group, which is basically the leading people who wrote the RICS ROBA guidance and all the major guidance on um, embodied carbon in the UK and, operation, and uh, whole life carbon. And one of the problems we're having at the moment is for operational energy, you use grid decarbonisation, but for materials and uh, uh, products, you don't use grid decarbonisation, even though they're going to be produced using grid electricity. So over time, as the grid decarbonises, it's going to be harder and harder to make the case for energy efficiency measures because the embodied carbon associated with these works starts to increase. Uh, so there isn't a simple answer. At the moment, uh, it's, it's really taking a case-by-case -case basis. As I showed earlier, we were looking at industrial units and then they've got brick walls with no insulation, but it makes no sense lining them uh, with insulation because that, that carbon won't pay back over 30 years uh, because they, they have such low heat loss. So it's, it's using a mixture of common sense and future modeling, but the modeling can be skewed by some of the data that's out at the moment. And that's what the whole life carbon group is really looking at over uh, the next year or so is really looking at really trying to define how we future proof. So at the moment doing whole life carbon is really important, but difficult to do. Uh, the focus should be on that upfront embodied carbon and the energy intensity targets. And that's why energy intensity has moved away from kilograms of CO2 to kilowatt hours, because it's basically saying that we need to consider electricity as a finite resource and conserve it as much as possible. Because if we do get to a net zero carbon grid, we still can't uh, allow people to use as much energy as we want because that will put us back out of balance. We need to drive the energy efficiency and that only comes from energy intensity targets in kilowatt hours per meter squared, not kilograms of CO2. Good, uh, thank you, Simon. Uh, so just two more questions. Do green, brown or blue roofs provide a noticeable benefit to carbon neutral uh, building? Uh, they provide a benefit. It's more, again, that's more to do with uh, um, surface wall runoff and flooding. Uh, so it's an adaptation measure. Uh, and again, with climate change going the way it is in the UK, we're gonna see more flash flooding. Uh, lo local authorities are requiring almost greenfield runoff for most sites, so it's really important. There is a carbon benefit as well, because if you are reducing the runoff to sewer, you can actually reduce your sewer networks and the infrastructure costs, which were, I'm looking at a few large master planning projects in the moment, and we're trying to um, reduce the amount of sewer and stormwater facilities we need, which has a carbon saving. But in existing buildings, not massively, because the, the, the infrastructure is already in place, but it puts less stress on that infrastructure, so it needs less upgrades in the future. Uh, thank you. And uh, last question. We've had uh, display energy certificates for 12 years, but government has totally neglected them. Will things really get better? Uh, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, so the UK government has been heavily driven by the EU requirements for things like en display energy certificates, uh, EPCs, energy performance certificates, and they haven't really fully backed or embraced them. But what we've seen over the last year is a significant movement from government, especially started by Theresa May and her government was looking at actually embedding. Uh, so Theresa May actually declared the climate emergency and amended the Climate Change Act, and they we're looking at effective changes to the building regulations and as I said bringing in these mandatory operational energy performance uh, operational performance obviously over the last uh, few months uh, the government has been preoccupied with both the pandemic and Brexit negotiations so there's been a lot less movement and traction than we'd hoped for but we're hoping that once uh, we can start moving away from those two major issues that the climate issue will become the number one issue again and they'll start focusing on that. Uh, there's no guarantee, but as I said at the beginning with those drivers for change, government is one driver. Local authorities, we're seeing huge uh, programs from those local authorities. All those local authorities have declared emergencies well in advance of 2050 and are gonna be setting uh, requirements of planning, but it won't just be planning because they need to tackle their existing stock. So we expect them to be setting mandatory requirements for existing buildings. And again, investors, uh, are requiring certain standards so using things like Gresby task force for financial disclosure uh, people won't be able to buy or let buildings which are poor performing going forward uh, because they won't be able to get the finance to do so so yes that decks haven't done anything for the last decade uh, but I am hopeful that uh, in the next decade 
there will be a number of measures which will drive that forward. Thank you, Simon. Um, so that uh, kind of wraps up our session. Um, if you do have any other questions, feel free to send us an email and we'd be happy to, um, to get back to you to answer these questions. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we've recorded this session and um, it will be available on YouTube. So thank you everybody for joining and have a good day. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you all. Bye.